Hey everyone, Denise Fleck, the Pet Safety Crusader here, and technology is not on my side today, so hopefully this is working now, and we're going to take pages 55 and 56 out of the Pet Safety Bible to talk about fleas and ticks. Now I have the written blog there. I know some of you rather listen than read, but the blog, um, the written blog always has more detail. So please do peruse it afterwards. Um, I will post it as soon as we're done with the video today. But I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about fleas and ticks. And I know if you go online, uh, some of the preventatives are scary as can be. Uh, you're going to hear that your dog's going to have seizures or their neck is going to be lose all its hair and have skin raw. Obviously, any kind of medication has a risk, but I do want to remind you that not using a preventive and having your dogs and cats bitten by fleas and ticks is a risk in itself. So really, the determination needs to be made by you and your veterinarian. You must really have a veterinarian you can chat with about this and make some decisions. But for starters, let me just remind you that there are something like 2,000 different kinds of fleas out there. Um, the cat flea, of course, it has its long little Latin name to it, but the cat flea is the one that typically, um, you know, bites our dogs and cats and often us too. Sometimes a flea bite will make, you know, a pet or a person very itchy. Whereas with other people and pets, a bite or two can make that animal downright miserable. Uh, fleas have in their saliva an anticoagulant that actually, you know, prevents your blood or your dog's or cat's blood from clotting so that the flea can continue to feast on its blood meal. And um, that, along with other elements in the saliva, can really cause terrible allergic reactions that can last for weeks after the bite. So, you know, don't think your dog or cat's just scratching a little and has a bite. Some of them absolutely do have um, flea allergies. So it's important to pay attention to this. A couple things I want to mention about fleas, because I hear this a lot. My cat's an indoor cat. She can't possibly have fleas, but I don't know why she's scratching. Sorry, I didn't mean to use that voice. I don't know where it came from. Um, but uh, you know what I just will say? Fleas can come across the threshold. They can come in on our pant leg or our shoes. They can come in on another animal. Indoor cats can get fleas. Ticks too when we get to that. But absolutely they can. Um, people may think, well, I have a senior pet. Now my senior dog doesn't go out as much as he used to. He just goes out to potty and comes right back in and we just, you know, go off the patio or off the driveway area, not into the, you know, heavy woodlands. It only takes a moment for a flea to jump on a dog. So, you know, don't think that your pet is out of the woods because he or she is spending more time indoors. I, I just want to make a point of that. Um, a great little method that I often teach in my classes is to get out when the little flea comes with the teeth that are really tight together and run it across your pet's back, especially right at the base of the tail where the tail connects to the, the torso on the top there and get out some of that dirt. Then get a paper towel, get it damp, preferably white, but you know, if there's colors on it, probably not a big deal, and clean out that comb really good on that damp paper towel. If, it, if what comes out of the comb just sits there on the paper towel, um, it probably is dirt, your dog or cat's dirty or been rolling in the dirt, or maybe that's dander. But if the paper towel starts to turn the least bit pink, that's dehydrated blood of your pet. So that means there are fleas, whether you're seeing them or not, that are making a blood feast out of your pet. Um, you know, pets groom themselves and they'll lick and chew and eat the fleas off of themselves. So you may not see them. Some of them, you know, if you're like me, you need these things on all the time to see these tinier things nowadays. So, you know, don't, don't think that you can go without preventive or that your pet doesn't have fleas if they don't go out very often. Uh, and, and once, you know, a pet starts to lick and bite and groom themselves from these bites that become so irritating, they can make lick sores and um, hot spots that then are really, really hard to heal. And then they're subject to like a secondary infection from the yeast and the bacteria that's getting in there besides um, the allergic reaction from the flea saliva. 
Then there are ticks, and there are, I think, more than 800 different types of these little crawling arachnids, um, and there are about 150 different diseases people and animals can get from ticks. Once again, um, you know, people think, well, my cat stays indoors, she's never going to get ticks. Actually, um, cytozoonosis can take a kit cat down in just a couple of days. Um, it's often referred to as bobcat fever, and I, the Lone Star tick is one of the main ones that transmits it. The Lone Star one we can always um, identify because it has like a little white spot on her back, but um, it causes multiple organ failure in a cat, and I mean a cat can die very quickly from one tick bite if that tick has cytozoonosis. Remember, ticks have little hypostomes. Um, think of them like the tips of tweezers, only even more minuscule, um, that you know penetrate the skin of you, your dog, or your cat. And that's how they suck the blood out and have their blood feast. But that's also how they put bacteria into pets and people too. Um, this is a difficult one because again, you know, sometimes you don't always get the best information online and sometimes you get fabulous information, but it depends where you look and who you're talking to. But um, sometimes it, you'll hear that it takes it for a tick to remain attached for about 24 hours before they can actually inject disease. I, I wouldn't even go with that number. I, I think it could be, you know, a couple of hours. Um, ticks can stay on for three days. They can stay on for seven days. They feast very slowly before they actually, you know, drop off and disengage, so to speak. Um, just because a tick has bitten your pet, though, doesn't mean he has injected the bacteria. So the key is to get that tick off quickly. Um, my favorite method is to get a cotton ball and soak it either in dish soap or rubbing alcohol and place it on the tick first. Very often that will cause him to back off or I should say back out of the skin of your pet, and then you just need to pick him off the fur and dispose of him properly. Um, if you actually need to get out the teeth, the tweezers, I will say tick ease are ones I highly recommend. Um, I've ha had different ones when I was making pet first aid kits over the years, but the last generation of my pet first aid kits always had tick ease in them, and they have this cool little device here you can see with the slit in it that you can get underneath the tick and pick it up and it actually has the forceps or the the tips that you can pull a tick off. Uh, there was one summer many many years ago I was learning and reading about ticks and up until that point whenever I removed a tick with tweezers I kind of always gave it a half twist and I thought it did a really good job but from everything I read you cannot unscrew a tick. Um, so it's best just to get as close to the skin without pulling your pet's skin or fur and lifting the, the tick straight out. And then cleaning the area with some hydrogen peroxide or some Bactine or some Neosporin type product. You know, obviously preventing your pet from licking there, but just trying to ward off infection. Don't smash the tick afterwards. You're going to spread bacteria. And then you won't have the tick if you need that tick as evidence because your pet's suddenly having some kind of infection or reaction to it. Drown them in some alcohol instead. Not Jim Beam, but that rubbing alcohol. And then keep them in a Ziploc baggie so that if your pet is having an infection or a reaction to the tick, you have the tick to show. Hey, Lisa, nice to see you. Um, other things you don't want to do or you don't want to, you know, try to burn the tick off. You're more likely going to burn the cat or the dog. Don't smother him in Vaseline or nail polish. Those used to be the old things we would do. But whenever a tick is feeling smothered, he regurgitates his stomach contents into the pet. So it's more likely your pet will get bacteria and disease. Also, and trust me, I've been there, done that, all of my years of rescue work out in the California desert with, you know, 100 Akitas trying to pull ticks off quickly, we would use our fingers. Don't do it. You actually squeeze their tiny little abdomens, and what that does, again, is cause them to <laughs> regurgitate their stomach contents into the pet. So um, use tweezers. Like I said, I love tick ease, but whatever ones you have that work, we all have to find a tool that works for us. Um, and take the tick off, drown him, yes, Lisa, um, in the rubbing alcohol. 
and you know keep him in a Ziploc baggie. Once he's dead, keep him between two pieces of cellophane tape, just something so you have him to show the veterinarian. Don't think by flushing them down the toilet or the sink that you've gotten rid of ticks. They have little valves in their, their lungs and actually many times they will end up crawling back up in the middle of the night or whenever they get there. So it's better to um, do what I just mentioned and um, you know dispose of the tick properly. Now one of the best things we can do again is you know prevent the ticks getting on our pets or biting them in the first place. And like I said at the beginning of the segment here, if you go online and read about all of these tick preventives, you're going to scare the bejeebers out of yourself with all of the things that can possibly happen to your pet. What I caution you to do is go sit down, have an honest conversation with your veterinarian. Your veterinarian knows your pets and your pet's medical history. And the veterinarian also knows the, your hood, the neighborhood in which you live and what kind of ticks and fleas are there and what is working and what isn't. Um, I went through, while I was still in California, several different types of preventives because after a while, the, the ticks in the area basically became immune to them. It didn't do anything. Frontline was working for a long time. It just completely stopped working. I think then we were doing Advantix and it just stopped working. So you need to, you know, get that information, the 411, so to speak, from your veterinarian who knows what is and isn't working in the area. Another question I love to pose, I'm, I put my veterinarian on the spot, but I always do this kind of thing as I say, what do you use on your personal pets? You know, you got to think that what a veterinarian is using on his or her personal pets, they, you know, recommend. I know sometimes, you know, in certain professions, we don't want to recommend brands, but you know, this is your pet, this is your veterinarian, so they should be recommending brands anyway, but find out what they're using. Uh, my particular veterinarian for our area in Northwest Georgia is using Brevecto, which is an oral chewable. I asked if I didn't want to use a chewable, what her other um, suggestion would be, and hers would be the Soresto collar. I've spoken with another veterinarian in South Carolina, and she says she does recommend highly the Soresto collar, but the key is that you have to keep it in contact with the pet's skin. If it's just loose and touching the fur, it doesn't do the job. But then this morning on Facebook, I saw a horrendous picture of a dog that supposedly was wearing a Soresto collar. So let me get back to this. Talk to your veterinarian who knows your pet's medical condition and what kind of needs exist for preventives um, in your area, what parasites are out there. Then once you make a decision, monitor your pet. Every pet doesn't react the same way to every medication, whether it's oral, topical, or otherwise. Just like us humans, um, some people take codeine really well. If I take codeine, you, you won't know who I am. Um, you know, so it's just, you gotta pay attention. You gotta be that advocate for your pet. So basically there are the oral chewables which you give your pet about once a month, I mean, depending on the brand, but that's pretty accurate. Problem with that, in my mind, is that the, the tick has to actually bite your pet in order to get that medication, that insecticide, so to speak, to kill him. But like we discussed earlier, it does, even though we don't know that exact window, but it does seem to be a window of time in which the tick has to actually be sucking the blood before disease is put in. So the, um, the oral chewables um, hopefully negate that problem. Then there are the topicals that you generally put on between the shoulder blades. You have to part the fur and get it on the skin and the oil glands and just kind of gravity um, cause it to spread around. The one issue, well, I'll say one of the issues I um, want you to just be advised with these is that if you have multiple species in the house or different sized dogs or even human kids, um, you want to be very careful none of the animals come in contact with the one that's been treated until that really dries. It's so important when you're using preventatives that you read the directions and follow them explicitly, that you dose according to the size and the species. Don't have a little dog um, preventive left over and put it on the cat. My gosh, um, that could be one of the worst things you could do. Don't have a little of the Great Danes um, preventative left over and put it on the Chihuahua. 
make sure you dose according to the species and the weight of the pet. That is so vital. And what I also mean by this is if you're treating all the pets and the big dog goes and lays in his bed and the cat normally loves to snuggle, don't let her get in the bed with the dog or rub against him until that preventative is, is dry. So very important. And same thing with kids, you know, playing with the pets. But there are the oral chewables. The topicals generally last um, about six weeks. The collars can last up to eight months. So, I mean, that's kind of a no-brainer if you don't want to think about it. But it's also out of sight, out of mind. You're not doing anything about it regularly. So I just really caution you to tune in and, you know, look at your pet's neck every day or two. Just make sure everything is A-OK. -okay. Now, there are some of the old-fashioned things like the powders and the flea dips. I would never recommend for somebody to do a flea dip by themselves. Um, I think that's something that should be done under, you know, veterinary control. You're definite, you're dipping your pet into insecticide. And if they're an older pet or one with a compromised immune system, if you don't know what you're doing, you can certainly cause some issues. Now, I, you know, just been in a quandary with Mr. Haiku here. He's 14. Um, we've always, you know, kept him relatively flea and tick free. Uh, in California, we used one thing our, our first year here in Georgia. We used the Brevecto Chewable. Um, I got a little freaked out about it because the doggy I knew started having seizures on it. So I talked to my veterinarian about it, and she says Haiku has no medical history of seizures. He will be fine, and that's what she, in fact, use on, uses on her dogs. So sometimes you need to find out the different layers of things. If dogs are having seizures from a medication, maybe they were prone to those, you know, with or without the the medication anyway. But what I'm doing for the first part of early spring here is I've just, you know, been doing my research and reading and looking around and I've actually been using a more um, natural spray. Now the natural sprays obviously, you know, can be a great choice, but you know, they have their drawbacks too and they don't last very long. Usually once the scent is gone, so is the effectiveness. So I came across this one. It's good for both dogs and cats. Natural organic neem oil also has peppermint and lavender essential oils. This one actually is, it claims to last about a week on your pet or when you no longer smell it in the fur, you should try again. So I'm giving it a go rather than giving him more of an insecticide Right now in early spring, we may have to shift gears. I hope not. I hope this is going to work for him because um, I'm, you know, just at that point too, you, as those of you that follow know, he's had a couple of cancer scares and I'm just trying to keep him as natural and healthy as I possibly can. And as he gets to the end of his 14th year and starts on number 15, but like I said, we have to be very careful because there's a risk in putting any kind of medicine in or on our pet, always, same for ourselves. But there's also a risk in not putting that preventive on and having your pet, you know, get some sort of um, flea allergy and scratching himself to death and getting secondary infections and wounds that won't close or actually getting tick diseases. Now, if a dog has, for instance, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, we're not going to get that from the dog, but we can get it from the tick that bit the dog too. So there's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which on us looks like a rash. There's Lyme disease, which looks kind of like a target, a red circle with another red circle around it. There's ehrlichiosis. There's babesiosis. There, there's just so many actually new and emerging um, tick diseases, particularly with dogs, but I already mentioned um, the cytozoonosis for the cat as well. So talk to your vet, make sure your pet is protected in some way. If, if nothing else, that every single time you come in from the outdoors, you're going over him with a flea comb and really searching for those ticks, but I know none of us can do that. Back in your house regularly, bathe the dog and cat's bedding. You may need to treat your yard as well. Um, food grade diatomaceous earth is something that's often used in the yard or nematodes, but then every time it gets wet, um, that kind of goes perfunk, so to speak. But the message here is, you know, there's a risk in everything we do and we have to weigh those risks. 
We don't want our pets to get any terrible sort of flea or tick disease. I mean, for being tiny little creatures, they can take a big human or an animal down. So do your research. Please go back and read the blog. I also give you details in the written blog on what to do should your pet have gotten bitten and be licking and licking and licking and created some sort of lick sore or hot spot. Um, some various first aid techniques you can um, embark on until you get to veterinary care. So as always, thank you guys for tuning in today. Pause cross for pet safety and have an awesome, awesome rest of your week. Bye-bye for now.